The panelists are, include a broad cross-section of experts who both have looked at issues around health disparities from a quantitative angle and from a community angle. And I think that's the theme of today is to think about what are the set, broad set of tools that will help drive uh, community empowerment and they include all of the above. Um, the panelists include Tamu Jones who is on my far right, your left who is the program manager for the California Endowments Building Healthy Communities Program in Los Angeles. To her left is Professor Lavana Lewis, who's a professor at the USC Price School of Public Policy. Working this way, we have Professor Bill Vega, who's a provost professor at the USC Susan Orak Peck a School of Social Work and executive director of the Roy Ball Institute on Aging. To his left, we have John Moon, who's the District Manager in Community Development at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And moderating our panel today is Dr. Dana Goldman, who's Distinguished Professor and Holder of the Leonard D. Schaefer Chair and Director of the USC Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Just by way of introduction, there's probably a 13-year difference in life expectancy between uh, an African-American male who doesn't complete high school and a white male who's college educated in the United States. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's about the same as the difference in life expectancy uh, between uh, a male born in Japan and Kazakhstan. So the, clearly, there are issues with health disparities, and I don't think we could assemble a much better panel to think about how that relates to Los Angeles than the folks we have here. And so we're going to invite them to come up and give some introductory remarks. Um, and I think we have some slides. We're going to go in order from the program. And Tamu, please. I was asked to talk a little bit about the California Endowment and the work that we are doing. Um, how many of you have heard of the California Endowment? Lovely. Um, so most of you then know that the California Endowment is a health foundation. Uh, we were founded a little more than, than 20 years ago now. Um, and our core mission um, is really about increasing access to affordable quality health care for underserved individuals and communities and to promote the fundamental improvements in the health status of Californians. And I read that on purpose because when you read our mission in its core, it sounds like the emphasis is really on health care and health systems. And I think when it was originally founded, that is true. And I think that there was an evolution in the thought about how we think about what actually makes communities healthy as the organization continued to grow and evolve. And just about seven years ago, we launched into an initiative called Building Healthy Communities, which embraced what I feel like is the second part of that mission that talks about the fundamental improvements in the health status of Californians in those conditions. Because what we really began to do in Building Healthy Communities was to build out our recognition around the social determinants of health. Because what we realized is that if you even have, if you have the access to the best, most high qualified doctor, but you're returning to a community that is fundamentally unhealthy, whether that's because of the air that you breathe or the, the condition of the housing in which you live or your ability to access healthy foods or a place that is, has been talked about in previous panelists where it's over-policed and there's fear, right? So there's trauma that's happening in these communities that the reality is that we cannot anticipate that we can have health just by dealing with it in a doctor's office. And so building healthy communities is fundamentally about really beginning to get at those underlying causes of the disparities we see. Um, so I don't have to quote the example because I was going to give a similar example about the difference in life expectancy across communities. You can be as short as five to ten miles away and have a life expectancy difference of five, ten, fifteen years depending on your context, right? So place matters. And for us, the, the fundamental underpinnings of the way that we're making grants and the initiatives that we're doing is really about recognizing the significance of place. And in that recognition of place as a part of how we discuss disparities, it's also an intersection not just with place, but also around race, class, and history. And that context within that place dictates in many ways what happens in that community and therefore your ability to live healthy life and your healthy pathways, right? And so that is a core principle in how we move our work. 
And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the premise before I get into the what of what we do. And so I think place is one fundamental piece. Um, another fundamental piece in the way we think about our work at the California Endowment is we're centered around this issue of power. Because the reality is that community conditions that we're talking about are inherently tied to the distribution of power and the allocation of resources in those communities. You cannot separate those things. And so for us, what is really central in the way we approach our work is to think about how is it that we can support um, shared decision making and community led solutions and a shifting of that power so that community is also in the driver's seat and is also helping to shape the way in which those resources get allocated and shape the kind of policies that ultimately determine those decisions that get made in those neighborhoods, not just to them, but with them. Uh, the other critical underpinning for us is really about how um, sustainable solutions, which is tied to the previous point around um, changing those conditions, is that we really have to get to policy. Oh my, two minutes. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go a little longer. So we have to really get to we, <laughs> we have to get to policy, um, and we have to we have to really sort of think about not just the policy in terms of laws, but we also have to think about policy in the sense of the way systems operate, because those things are also related. So I'm gonna try to quickly get through because I know time is short. The other critical piece about how we approach our work is the importance of narrative. Well, before I say that, the other critical piece, not just about policy and systems, but when we're thinking about changing the way systems work and operate, what is really important for us is that we have to think about that the way we sustain policy changes and system changes is that actual uh, systems, when you're talking about your healthcare system, your education system, that they actually have to recognize the own patterns in the way that they do their work that actually perpetuate the disparities that we see in communities. And part of what we're doing through building healthy communities is helping to lift up and push, right, on those systems to recognize the patterns that perpetuate it. The last piece about how we approach our work is around narrative. And so we recognize that tied to policy, um, as well as tied to politics, is the story that we tell about con uh, conditions in communities, the story we tell about the people in those communities, and the story we tell about what it is that caused those conditions that is very instrumental to how policy is made. I heard someone earlier talk about that data doesn't matter. You could, you know, till you're blue in the face, quote data and pieces of information, but if there's a story that gets told and that story sticks, that's what's going to drive. And so what's important to us is also how do we shift narrative around doing that? And within the context of that work, we fund in three big buckets, and I promise I will end here, three big buckets of work um, for us. Um, we talk about our work within um, Health Happens with Prevention, which is really about supporting um, access to um, health systems that prioritize prevention and coverage for all individuals. Uh, the second uh, bucket is really about uh, health happens in neighborhoods, and so that covers for us both things around criminal justice system as well as things around um, supporting the stabilization of communities and working against gentrification and displacement. It also has to do with things like park equity and issues about the built environment. And our third category of work is really around schools. So how do we promote positive and supportive learning environments that actually supports resiliency of young people and doesn't push them out? isolate them and over punish them in ways that actually put them in touch with the criminal justice system rather than opportunities for their growth into the future. So um, I'll save and reserve uh, other things that I was going to comment on for later, but I, that's the brief introduction about how we approach our work at the California Endowment. Since we're talking about place matters, uh, I want to say the placement on the stage makes sense because the work I'm going to be talking about uh, goes back to 1999. And some of the concepts that Tamu was talking about, uh, we've been working on the ground since, as I said, 1999. And I want to talk about this issue of addressing health disparities by building coalitions from the ground up by saying, um, when I first got to USC and we talked about research in South LA, uh, the community was very used to drive-by research or helicoptic research where people came in and collected data and disappeared and that was the end of the story. Or we heard that people read about LA, uh, South LA, but I've actually never been there. And so we thought that it was critical to, as been said already, to really talk about uh, South LA in a very kind of concrete way that was both rigorous and relevant. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to start by showing you this very complicated uh, diagram, 
which is the Community Health Councils, which is the organization that we've been working with, which has its genesis in the 1992 civil unrest. That is its initiation date. And so over this kind of um, 1999 to 2015, this idea of how does community-led, community-initiated change take place. And I wanted you to see this kind of complex um, diagram because we're living in a soundbite world and sometimes the issues are just too complicated for, you know, 26 characters. And so to understand that we're talking about a very involved process, we're talking about a whole system of very concrete and developing relationships, and again, the idea that this is community-led, community-driven, and so again, the community has the greatest voice. It really is around building capacity for a community's re um, expertise to be recognized, and for someone that's an academic to really be intentional about the fact that, you know, some of our academic work can be replaced by the community. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that took place with uh, community health councils and the work that they've been doing. And so this is kind of the, uh, the uh, various stages of the project. Um, and these are all uh, Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention funded projects. And I want to start with the African Americans Building a Legacy of Health project by saying that people in the community were meeting already to talk about the issues, particularly as related to health issues, particularly for South LA cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so when the funding came, they already had a collaboration that had some traction. It was over 50 organizations, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, academic institutions, mom and pop shops, private sector, but it really recognized the complex set of relationships that were going to be necessary for something that was going to have a, a long-term impact. Uh, fast forward to uh, 2012, Community Transformation Grants, another CDC-funded project, and all of the lessons learned initially in the REACH, uh, African Americans Building a Legacy of Health project, were very clear in terms of the guidance. No matter what you were learning, no matter what you were doing, your target audience is African American. So there could not be bringing in other organizations, other ethnic groups, other ethnic disease, uh, diseases to the program. But with a new round of grants, we got a different opportunity. Basically, we were able to take the lessons learned in that first project and share them across the board with other organizations in South LA, uh, 14 to be exact, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it really was this idea of developing a learning community where we recognize that each organization, each community had its own expertise, and our challenge as the evaluation team was to find ways to document that uh, expertise in ways that were meaningful, to tell the story that the community wanted to tell, but also move decision makers in an evidence-based environment that says you've got to have data that's rigorous. And so again, developing the community's capacity to do that on their own. And then the last one is the REACH Demonstration Project. There were two of those grants given nationwide. One went to the Department of um, Public Health in Boston, and the other grant went to CDC. And I think it was a very clear intention on the part of the CDC to, see, to challenge whether or not the traditional public leadership was going to give us greater leverage or if this more community-based, community-driven dri community leadership might be more relevant. I should say that over the course of this kind of, you know, multiple years of evaluation, we probably developed some 50 evaluation instruments, everything from assessments of markets to restaurants to consumer preference surveys to needs assessments to really talk about the fact that it's not just that community have needs or deficiencies, but they also have assets. And so being able to document those as well. And so this very complicated slide is this, the Community Transformation United for Health Collaborative. A leadership council which did one thing very important from the beginning, which basically said we've got 14 organizations, some with multi-million dollar, uh, multi dollar budgets, and some with just two staff, but everybody gets one vote. If you say no, it's not going to happen, end of story. And so the issue of equity was very important because there was no kind of um, 
um, you talk about power differential. As it related to this project, everybody was equal. It was a go if everybody said yes. If one person said no, it was dead on arrival. So very complicated. Lots of communities, but lots of committees, but it was how do you take this kind of very complex project across five different communities, East LA, South LA, Pacoima, Wilmington, and also parts of downtown, and again, tell the story that they want to tell. Again, our challenge was to document it. And then last but not least, this is the REACH project. And I should say that the CDC had no idea that they were sending millions of dollars into the same community because two different review teams reviewed the proposals. And so they were quite stunned when they realized how much money was going to LA. But it was too late because it was peer reviewed and the grants were both competitive. And so this, I, I leave this with you because I want you to understand, we start talking about sustainable kind of change. These are talking about practices that are going on with the school. We're already taking kids' weights. Let's give them some more, uh, you know, the, trying to figure out if they're physically fit. If they're not, here's some information to share with the parents about resources that are available in your community. So trying to taste that teachable moment and close the gap. We also talk about changing practices of the federally qualified health centers. Same kind of thing. If we're trying to get people access to services, let's provide services where people are already coming anyway. Not, let's not get them to go to another place, but this is a resource on site. And then this whole idea of planning. How do you change community plans and what happens on the ground in such a way that no matter who comes in to live in that neighborhood, they will be impacted by the changes that have been recommended by the community organizations. And I leave that because it's important to understand that we've been documenting the language that the community wanted in those community plans, and we're seeing that language in community plans. So community voice matters, and I thank you for your time. My name is Bill Vega, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, this has special meaning for me because I actually went to elementary school in Watson, went to a middle school, actually junior high in those days, and high school in South LA, went to Washington High School, graduated from Washington High School. But this was in the 50s and the 60s, of course. It's uh, been a, a bit of time since the, the event that we're talking about. But uh, nonetheless, I'll tell you, the experience that I had in those days and seeing the, the level of uh, misfortune and disease and poor quality of life actually motivated my entire career in the arena of health sciences and trying to find methods and, and procedures and policies and programs that can redress these problems because they have been around for so long, both uh, in, in, in this area as well as in other adjoining areas of Los Angeles. So what I'd like to do is make one central point because I know I don't have much time up here and I want to get this across to you quite fully. I think the central problem we're, you know, we're really dealing with, the big issue we're confronting is how much can we actually eliminate health disparities without equalizing income, without really getting to the fundamental issue of income. Now this is a, something that was put together actually by experts across the country, public health experts, that were trying to designate as best they could with expert opinion the four principal domains contributing to what produces health in America. And as you can see, they actually assigned what they considered to be the appropriate weights, what they considered to be the contribution to health in, in U.S. populations. So they saw health behaviors as 30% of it, clinical care is about 20% of it, social and economic factors about 40% of it, and physical environment about 10% of it. And of course, presumably they did this for the benefit of developing policies and programs that reflect these priorities. Regrettably, that's not what normally are what we do in health disparities. It does not reflect these priorities. And I think the, the, the biggest issue is that social and economic factors are primary to the other three domains. They are really structuring and conditioning the other three domains and the feasibility of those other domains. So therefore, I think we have to consider you know, education and income across the life course as being so seriously structuring life chances and health chances in American society. So I'll go on to the next uh, slide, if I can get this thing to move. OK, there we go. I just wanted to give you a little information, because I know I should, because we're talking about disparities. <laughs> Uh, if we talk about South LA, here's South LA in terms of, of demographics. Now, of course, we know it's a, you know, the area that has the greatest concentration of African Americans. It also has second highest among uh, Latinos. Uh, but when you look at the, the question of high school education or higher, you see that in, in uh, South LA, about 60, about 40 percent of the population, slightly more than 40 percent, do not have a high school education, as compared to all the other areas of LA, which you can see are vastly different. Look at West LA, 95 percent, of course, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, and then you can also look at the issues around uh, median income, and you can see that uh, in the South LA is by far the lowest, you know, across looking at all the areas in Los Angeles that are, are included here. 
Next one would be life expectancy at 50. Now, I think uh, this is the, a bit of a, a paradox here, a real paradox, because uh, you just heard about the, the statistics regarding life expectancy. That's coming from very good studies uh, around 12 to 14 years difference between the highest income and lowest income in the United States. Yet in, in, uh, in California and in Los Angeles uh, particularly, you know, we have uh, an interesting difference here. Yes, it's about five years difference, but it isn't anywhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 years. And I'm going to come back to that question a little bit at the, at the end of this three minutes that I have left in this thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> and fully explain it, of course. You know. <laughs> anyway, these are the three ma major health challenges in South LA from the work that we've been doing. It's, diabetes, of course, is number one, is the, the number one issue because it leads to so many other things, cardiovascular problems, et cetera, and of course, stroke. And uh, ultimately, Alzheimer's disease, strong con contributed to Alzheimer's disease. And we know that uh, you know, these, the Alzheimer's disease now is being looked at as almost diabetes type 3. You know, it's, it's sort of a, a continuing cycle of high risk going through to the endpoints of life. Depression, as well, is, a, is, is highest in, uh, in this area of, of Los Angeles. And hypertension, of course, which accompanies the, the entire picture of metabolic syndrome and inflammation, which covers you know, the risk spectrum of what are the diseases that are going to end your life prematurely. This is a map of LA done by uh, risk of diabetes, and of course, the darker the color, the worse the problem. Is uh, this is color coded? So this is South LA right here. This is East LA. So you can see, you know, it's it's been this way for a long time, and it has not changed much. And uh, if you look at the, the population statistics, it's very very high you know, for people who are uh, overweight. You know, so I know among, in the Latino population, it's, it's probably about uh, two thirds of the population is actually overweight or obese. Community assets, I'll just point out one since I only have two minutes. Uh, physicians, here's, here's a South LA compared to West LA, 49.1 per 100,000 versus 1,116. Now, I bet it's even higher for psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna conclude with this. This is a study that's very interesting. It came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And uh, what it did is to look at the uh, big cities nationwide and it looked at uh, the factors associated with lo longevity for low income people. And it's, Counterintuitive, as I mentioned earlier, because it does show that uh, in cities that have the greatest Gini factor, in, order, in other words, the, the greatest distance between you know, lowest low income people and high income people, uh, that, that have the gra greatest overall wealth, as, as uh, more or less portrayed by medium family income value, the highest percentage of immigrants, the highest percentage of government expenditures, and, the, and greatest population density, and highest percentage of college graduates, actually is all protective for, for uh, extension of life among low-income people compared to areas that don't have these factors. So I don't have a complete explanation for this, but I think it's sort of the, the issue of, you know, the, uh, the tide lifts all boats in, in one way or another. But what is the direct impact for places like South Los Angeles? Where are the benefits that are flowing into us? And ultimately, you know, I think the, the final, you know, issue I would raise on this is would be Again, going back to the central question, how much can we improve the health of people in South Los Angeles and other vulnerable communities in Los Angeles without raising the income and education substantially? Because we know, for example, in Alzheimer's that education and income provide a protective effect that actually is reducing the risk of Alzheimer's in people with greater than high school education while it goes up with, for people with lower, less than high school education. So, you know, this is a fundamental issue and I'm not saying that you can't improve it because we've improved it here in LA. We've brought down cardio mortality in the last 10 years by 40%. But Alzheimer's has gone up by 100%. So what, what it is that we've got one train going you know, 40 miles an hour, another, you know, the, the train for people that are well educated and the other train is going about 20 miles an hour. They may both be making progress, but they're progressing at very different levels, very different rates when you look at the mortality data. Because no matter what we've done in, in disparities, you can see that we're getting this huge change an advantage for extremely high education income people and life expectancy that is not being shared in life extension for low income people. So good afternoon, uh, I'm John Moon with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and I have to say that uh, I really appreciate the invitation here. Um, 25 years ago uh, when I was uh, in college down the street at another college, um, I, I, I saw the city burn down and it really had a transformative effect on me. I, I literally changed uh, the direction I wanted my career as I really thought about the issues that um, seeing the issues of injustice uh, uh, being raised and, 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 and tensions between different communities. So, so you know, as actually, as the, 
you know, preparing for this, um, I've been doing a little bit of thinking of, and, and by the way, so this, all, all these are, are my opinions and not the opinions of, of the Fed. Uh, <laughs> So don't worry, we're not going to crash the economy. <laughs> um, but but um, I, I did think, in, in, in many ways, um, how much progress have, have we made? Uh, as I was thinking about it, you know, some of the same issues are persisting around uh, criminal justice. Um, and uh, in some ways, uh, the, 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 the time has changed, but maybe the names are, are, or the names have changed, but maybe the issues are, are, are persistent. And so for the Federal Reserve, you know, our interest in this is uh, we have the dual mandate, but basically what we have to do is make ensure that the economy is running at full uh, pr uh, productivity. And we want to make sure that all parts of our economy are working. And I have to say, as I reflect back about the, the challenges of really some of these systemic issues that are being raised that are contributing to these disparities, um, we need new and novel approaches. And, and so this is what one of the things I want to talk about. So I'm going to bring this back up real quick and talk about how place uh, impacts disparities. So uh, basically, this is the same point that was made earlier, but this is the uh, Center for Disease Controls. Uh, a diagram of how the bottom of the pyramid has the largest impact on factors that affect health, and as you go up is the smallest impact. The bottom factors are the socioeconomic factors, the, socio, uh, the um, social determinants of health, poverty, education, jobs, uh, just as we just heard, and as you go up to the behavioral, um, those have less impacts. Again, this is really important from, from the standpoint of how place impacts health and, and contributes uh, to health disparities. So this is a chart uh, from the economist Raj Chetty, who's done a lot of work on ec uh, economic mobility. And he also looked at the connection between how place and income matters. And so uh, this is a really interesting diagram because it shows both. Um, if you read the chart, you see the bottom 5% of median income. As you go to the right, you go to the top 5% of income. You start off at the left of four cities, New York City, San Francisco, Dallas, and Detroit. So you want to live in New York City because you have a higher life expectancy than Detroit. And so when you're starting at the bottom 5%, you see that place begins to matter. But as you go up the income scale, the, place, uh, the importance of place diminishes, and actually income is the overriding factor as uh, it, it, it starts to um, come together um, as you go up into median income. And so this is really important to understand what aspects of specifically of the built environment contribute to health disparities. <clears throat> so specifically, um, so in, in terms of going back to the, uh, the, the pyramid, um, the socioeconomic factors. So here in LA, uh, displacement impacts are certainly a, a huge challenge. Uh, you see issues around proximity to jobs, uh, quality housing, uh, household financial uh, well-being. Um, access to quality education. These are sort of uh, the primary effects that relate to um, the impacts on health. When you look at the actual physical form of the built environment, um, it can promote or uh, take away from issues around safety, social cohesion, physical activity, what makes a community. And then at the individual level, um, issues especially of toxic stress. Toxic stress uh, medically and biologically uh, triggers cortisol levels, which then impact and trigger other uh, onset of disease. And so you see all of these different factors playing out as, as you imagine a, a particular place. And so you can see how um, the uh, disparities start to come together. Um, given that we have a, a little bit, or I'm, I'm running out of time, let me just uh, cut to the chase here. So. Uh, one of the things that um, we've been really working on, and the California Endowment and many others, uh, is this idea that we need to approach this problem together. And so this is one example of both the uh, challenge and the opportunity. So uh, in the New Yorker, the, there was a story about Million Dollar Murray, a homeless man in Reno who bounced around the public health, uh, public health uh, the, the hospital systems, the criminal justice system, social systems, and he cost the public an annual amount of a million, of, of million dollars. So instead of having him bounce around the different agencies, um, there's been an effort to bring people into a place, uh, provide just basic uh, housing. And if you can do that, you can substantially uh, produce cost savings. This is an example of Bud Clark Commons in Portland, Oregon. So they, um, the, the, public, um, the public paid for uh, uh, 300 units of affordable housing. You see on the left, before they moved in the chronically homeless, the, the cost was uh, $1,600 on average. And then after they started to move in, you start to see the, the public cost go down uh, significantly from $889,995 to uh, $680. So uh, savings of uh, about 
about $1,600 for, for the three years. So this is an example of how we can do the work differently, how the health sector can come together with the housing sector, and the importance of, of coming together. Um, I just came from this morning from the California Endowment where they were bringing people, uh, leaders in housing and health. And uh, I'll leave you with this. So uh, one of the, the um, uh, speakers uh, from a county uh, uh, public health department in San Mateo, what she said was, health is, is the criminal justice system. And I would say health is uh, the physical uh, built environment because when you see how the physical uh, environment and the built environment impacts access to jobs, quality housing, what it makes a community, um, these are all important elements. And, and, and finally, on this issue of power, I think this is a really important one because when you look at the built environment and how decisions are made, in the past, uh, big decisions around infrastructure of where a freeway goes or where our transit goes, in many cases, it would completely commu uh, uh, bisect communities. In many ways, it would spatially isolate communities. And so these public decisions, public-private decisions, really need to involve community and community voice as, as, as one of the processes to mitigate uh, uh, impacts of health disparities in, in, in place. So, so with that, thank you very much. So uh, Tamu made the point, and I think it's very important to emphasize that we really need sustainable solutions for policy. And Levana followed up and said, there's a lot of heterogeneity across communities, and we really need to think about what the needs are in each of these places. And then Bill and John made the point that if, especially if we're interested in health disparities, it may not be health care. So I want to bring it back to the policy question and make the following observation, which is next year, the federal government may spend $1.5 trillion on health care, and they'll probably spend $800 billion on military and interest payments. And so about 85 to 90 percent of our government spending is devoted towards those resources. And I mean, ben Bernanke, the former chairman of the Fed, and some of you have heard me say this before, once said, the United States is a health insurer with a Navy. And <laughs> so, you know, and when we think about how are we going to address these problems, I think the people up here are saying the, way, the solution here is not to spend uh, money in this way, but actually to think about how we might better allocate it. And so my question for you is, in a world where we are, are not going to be able to make extra investments. How would you be reallocating federal funding and what can be done about that uh, in order to better improve population health in the community? Anyone want to grab that one? So, so I'll start because I, I spend a lot of time talking about heroic medicine and the fact that we will spend millions of dollars to um, forgive me, prolonged death instead of prolonged life, and something has to change. It's, um, it's hard for a, an elected official to celebrate the diseases that didn't happen, yeah. right? And so there has to be a way that we translate those diseases that didn't happen to those kind of bottom line figures that matter to people. And so it really is around, you know, first of all, doing what we can to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And right now, that's not the same everywhere. And so before we kind of demonize people for making bad choices, we need to really do a good job in terms of understanding what those choices are. And so the idea of making healthy food, physical activity, those kind of preventive um, activities more readily accessible, for me, it would be worth the investment. Because you're really saying that you know, there, there is a need to give people ownership of their health. But again, if I'm in a toxic place, it's not fair to, give, to put the same set of expectations on me that you would to put on somebody in West LA. Bill? Well, since I was a child, I, I, th I have noted that there's such fragmentation and poor coordination in our educational system in terms of linkaging with effective preparation for life from the standpoint of occupational potential. And so the ability, I think, of, of our society to move forward it, at this moment, in very great sense, is, is consistent, I think, with what one of the things that the current administration is saying, to improve more job opportunity, which is to coordinate 
education more carefully and, and more, more carefully linked with, with uh, industry so that we can really get the kind of technological bite that, you know, in, in included in the education in, in public schools and, and otherwise that people can really use as they move forward. There was, you, you come out of school today the same way as when I came out of school. You're just dumped on the sidewalk. And you really don't have the, 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 the kind of skill level and to move into any kind of, we've, I mean, we've always known, for example, in Germany, that the apprentice system works exceptionally well. When people are funneled into Mercedes Benz and taught to be Mercedes mechanics and they make a lot of money and they have secure benefits, et cetera. We've never had anything of this type that really produced a bridge from public education or whatever form of education you received, the private or public, to occupational opportunities that scale you into something that's firm, that continues your occupational training over the life course, which you're going to need because technology changes so quickly. That level of thinking and policy is just not evident in this society. And it's very consistent with the whole question of how do we make this a pool of people who potentially could be very useful in our society and be employed and earning, earning money and uh, avoid a lot of the lifestyle issues associated with the negative side of not being employed, you know, if, if we could just bring to light the necessity for doing this in a tangible way, not a, not a fantasy, but in a, a tangible way with policies and programs that are supported and that really allow this kind of coordination between preparation, education, and occupational readiness. So John, uh, I'll let you answer that, but I'm also gonna ask you another question, which is you made the point in your remarks that in some ways this is about the criminal justice system and this is another. Uh, Jim Heckman, the Nobel laureate in economics, has done a lot of work in early childhood education, for example, and he even went back to um, kids in the 1970s who were part of an experiment for early childhood education in North Carolina. These were very disadvantaged kids, and he showed that if you invest in these kids, it has a lifetime of benefits, including reducing criminal activity, increasing work opportunity, and now we know actually improving blood pressure and lowering weight. And so uh, can you frame this in terms of investments and how sure. we fund investments? Sure. So um, I'll answer both of those questions. <laughs> uh, so by different measures, uh, the health care's uh, annual cost is three, like $3.3 trillion, and a lot of it is um, um, lost in, in, in a certain way in, in that you're treating the problem by the time it becomes a problem. So how can you go up so that you don't have to treat the problem and, and, and do the kinds of things of around early education? But the problem is that the shared responsibility and the shared savings are, are shared and they're diffused and so no one is willing to take action. But there's some promising activities happening. So again, these are uh, not these are my opinions, uh, but the Affordable Care Act is really pushing toward a pop model of population health, where uh, as, as everyone gets covered by insurance, uh, then uh, the hospitals and, and, and the, the, the uh, payers are on the hook to ensuring more um, uh, overall health improvement for the population. Uh, so that gives in the right incentives for hospitals and payers to go upstream and to start funding interventions so that they don't have to uh, pay for things that are not covered by in in insurance. So that's a it's, a it's a great movement and there are some early examples of how uh, new investors and new partners are coming together. And so, um, you know, for example, uh, in Port another example in Portland, Oregon, uh, five major hospital <coughs> systems came together to build affordable housing. They provided the, uh, the, the patient e uh, e equity in the investment of a $100 million um, low-income housing uh, project. And so you see the, the kind of the, the, the environment that the federal policy landscape is creating to drive investments, to drive, uh, bring new people in together, and to get that better alignment to, uh, between upstream cost savings to uh, prevent uh, treating uh, patients when, when the costs are significantly higher. So uh, following up on that, uh, Tamu, is it the case, again, coming back to, we spend maybe uh, $300 billion on hospital care in the United States in the federal level. Should we be paying hospitals for not getting people to come in through the doors rather than when they get people to come in through the door? Absolutely, and I think that we need to really think about community-based models across the board. Um, and I think that I think the, the upstream approach, what is at the heart of that is recognizing that there is no silver bullet, right? And, and that we can't trade one off thing for the other. It's like, well, if we don't fund hospitals, then we do this. That I think it's understanding if we fundamentally have a value system that's based on the, the value of everyone's life, 
and that we understand that, that everyone and all the conditions that surround them are, are really sort of geared towards so the wellness of all of us, because we know that there are only certain individuals, high flyers and other kinds of issues who are actually driving up costs when we're talking about health systems. And so in order for us to really think about that in a comprehensive way, we have to take a step back and really think about what are the comprehensive confluence of factors that are actually making it certain folks more vulnerable, other folks less vulnerable, and have an honest conversation about how we're sort of distributing those resources to ensure that everyone has access to be as healthy as they can be. That, I think, is, you know, if there was a silver bullet to be had, I think it's an integrated kind of model that is community-based and that is focused on equity and not about devaluing some one person's life over another person's life. So, Lavana, the following up on that, it, and your earlier point, and it's been important, is you talked about hel we don't want a helicopter in. Uh, although I would argue that some things like early childhood education are universal policy investments. But the question I have for you is, it, when we learn what works in a community, uh, so let's say someone says it's about the build environment. You, you want everyone to go for a walk. One of the best things we might do is get everyone to go for a walk, but if there are no sidewalks, that are navigable, what's, uh, then really the intervention isn't about uh, public health getting, telling people to walk, it's about fixing the sidewalks. But how do we translate uh, that information at the community level and learn from those lessons so that other communities can benefit? So um, the reason why I wanted to spend time with the United for Health project was because that, that's what happened, the fact that uh, each of the organizations were experts in their own right, in particular in, the, uh, in their own community. And so if it was their expertise that re related to environmental justice or physical activity, they came together and, and they shared those lessons with one another so that every organization got the benefit of that prior experience. And so they could figure out, you know, how do I tailor this to my neighborhood? So your example about, you know, we want a walking club, but the sidewalks are bad or their dogs running around or their lights are out mm -hmm. may mean that we have a joint use agreement with the school. So we'll use a school track when people aren't there or mm -hmm. we have a, 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 wa a walking club at the mall. But it is those kind of ways of getting people to have the conversation that are going to be critical. Because I think one of the things that happens all too often is that the community has to start over. There's a funding cycle, the money comes, and then you know, we go back to business as usual. But the thing about building community capacity around that knowledge base means that I can't unlearn this new way of operating. And so how do you get enough people in the room so that those lessons learned can be shared? I think the agencies do that, but I think, again, for, for folks who may have some resistance to kind of that public sector engagement, those kind of community voices, trusted voices, trusted institutions are critical for a dissemination. And actually, you've set up our next panel perfectly because That's really, <laughs> our next panel is going to solve this. And <laughs> they're going to tell us how we can use data to drive social innovation. But before we get off the stage, I just want to give each of you uh, an opportunity to, uh, if you have any salient points, and I'll start with you, Bill. You've already kind of made your point, but uh, <laughs> you know, what is the one lesson that we should draw? Or, let me rephrase it a little more provocatively. <laughs> what is the one investment we should be making in South Los Angeles at this point today if we really want to deal with those health disparities that you've put up on the board? I think planning comprehensive economic development okay. for the area. Thank you. Uh, John, same question. Well, I, I'd use a lot of money, and so the pot would be huge. <laughs> but I would, I would fund a community capacity to organize, to mobilize, and to really express their voice, and to be part of the formal decision-making process of how development happens, where infrastructure goes. Okay. Lavana? Um, so I, I'm torn because I, I want to, I think it's important that people understand uh, the need to meet people where they are. And so we can have grand designs, but if people aren't ready for that, it's dead in the water. And so to really take the extra time to find out what success means for that community and trying to do that. But, but for me, I'll go back to something that was said earlier. I really do think that if we don't make a bigger investment in the zero to five population, we're gonna be in bad shape. 
comment? I'm going to echo what my fellow panelists said, that I really think that the deep investment in the people of South Los Angeles is essential. Great. And I, you know, as the moderator, I get the last word, and I'll just say, let's fix the sidewalk. So with that, <laughs> thank you all very much.